There we go. Ready? Off we go. Okay, I want to say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we will give it a little while because I know sometimes Zoom takes a while for attendees to drop in. We've got over 70 people who have uh, signed up through Zoom and then people who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube as well because we're going live there. Uh, why people are dropping in, I do want to just introduce Professor Lisa Wallace from the School of Medicine and uh, Bethany as well. I met both Professor Wallace and Bethany when I was at the university just a few months ago as well at that amazing beachside campus uh, where I had a, a great time to see the facilities and, to, and I'm, uh, should be back there next month, I believe, with one of my colleagues from another university, which is another meeting we've arranged anyway. So it's a fantastic opportunity uh, here. And what I, I think what uh, Professor Wallace will discuss with the people who are signing up uh, uh, of watching today is the different opportunities that are available with all the different pathways because although a lot of people identify the pathway into medicine itself from the, the bachelor's degrees the bachelor's degrees themselves as I found when I was there provide a lot of opportunities into employment uh, and for other career opportunities which gives you that breadth of experience that you may want if you're thinking about a future in medicine or the health or the medical sciences. OK, so uh, people are I said, the, the numbers are going up. I'll keep an eye on the uh, on the social media. What I will say to people who are signed up today is we do have the Q&A feature active. So if at any point in the presentation, which Professor Wallace will, will deliver, is if you have a question, pop it into the Q&A feature and we'll deal with all questions at the end of the webinar. We will read the questions out because not everyone gets the chance to see them and then we'll deal with them one by one. What we won't do is obviously de-anonymize the questions. So don't worry if, you've, if, a, if you're asking a question, you think it's a silly question. My argument is there's no such thing as a silly or a stupid question, because if you've got that question, I can guarantee multiple other people watching or not watching today or watching afterwards will have the same question as well. So please just go in there, but we won't obviously divulge your name. This is being recorded, so it will be visible for people to watch later on in case you couldn't make it. Uh, so it's really any question that you have is really useful for anyone watching this live or watching a recording. OK, so, Professor Wallace, I do believe you have a presentation to deliver. I sure do. Bear with me real quick here while I get rid of something here. Um, all right, here we go. Let's go share screen. Okay, can we see that a blue screen? Certainly can. So okay, great. <laughs> well, now it's not blue, but thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Professor Lisa Wallace. I'm the Associate Dean International for the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Science at Swansea University. Um, and I'm joining you with Bethany Sawyer, our, our International Recruitment Officer. So um, thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to telling you about our opportunities. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about our faculty, the medical science pathways, our typical entry requirements, some scholarship and funding opportunities, as well as our student support and student services. And then we'll, as was mentioned, we'll have some questions and answers. So a little bit about Swansea, you can, you can probably tell, maybe tell from my accent that I'm probably not from Swansea. But um, so uh, I've come from the United States, but I've lived in Swansea for almost 13 years now. And I find it to be a beautiful part of the world that has outstanding natural beauty, but is is not very far from from where the action is from from cities and, and has quite a vibrant uh, city in and of itself. So we're in Southwest Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom. We're the second largest city in Wales. Uh, we have two, not just one, but two seafront campuses. Um, so right on the beach. Um, and we're on the edge of the Gower Peninsula, which is an area of outstanding natural beauty, beaches, hillsides, lots of opportunities to get out and relax. So um, we're not far from London, just less than three hours uh, by train, um, four hours from Manchester and about an hour from Cardiff. So lots of things happening here or close by. 
So a little bit about the city. Um, it's welcoming, friendly, tr trustworthy. It's quite safe as well. It's the sixth safest city accor according to the Complete University Guide. Um, it's affordable and um, a lot of really good uh, development projects are happening here. We have a new arena, uh, entertainment arena that's attracting lots of big name talent to come um, to the city and perform. We have um, Swansea City Football Club. Um, we have the Ospreys rugby team. We have lots and lots of, of wonderful things happening. And then there's, there's lots of investment happening in the city. So, um, like I said, it's, it's right by the sea. We're located on the bay, um, but we're not far from the mountains. So lots of things to do. Very walkable, um, friendly place um, that very much welcomes students um, and, and in an international way as well. So um, we have quite a substantial international community here. Um, lots of different foods and markets and things like that. So um, even though we're small and smallish and friendly, um, there's lots lots to do and see. Um, like I said, it's a pretty affordable city, um, which, it, which I know is, is really important for students, especially right now with the economy the way it is. Um, so we're 100 years old, just over 100 years old now as it, an institution. <clears throat> Um, we're about a mile from the city center, one of our campuses, the Singleton campus, where, where primarily the, the courses uh, that I'm talking about will be based. Um, we have over 20,000 students, 3,500 of whom are international. Um, we have over 3,000 staff, and we have staff and students from over 150, 130 countries, so very, very diverse from all different parts of the world. Um, have come here to, to engage in learning and teaching at Swansea. Um, so we are outstanding teachers. Um, this is, so TEF gold means that we've been awarded by the government. Um, there's, there's TEF gold, silver, and bronze, TEF gold being the highest. So this is a mark of our excellent um, teaching and learning. Um, and these scores are based upon student satisfaction, continuation rates, employment rates, and academic support. So academic support is something that we really, really emphasize here at Swansea. Um, um, we want you to come here and, and study, but we want to help you along the way. Okay, so a little bit about the Singleton Park campus. That's where most of the courses that I'll be talking about today are based. Um, we have seven canteens and coffee shops, a bank, a supermarket, lots of different food outlets. We even have an Egypt Center Museum. Um, we have a large pool and sports facility, doctor, surgery, dentist. Um, there are dormitories located on campus uh, for accommodation, but there's lots and lots of student accommodation off campus as well. Lots of students will come for their first year and, and have on-campus housing, but then move off campus. Afterwards, we have a library teaching facilities Etc. So lots of things on Singleton, and it's located in the middle of a park. So not only is there a beach across the road, there's a big park with lots of, of nature and beauty and beautiful plants um, right uh, situated right on the campus. So a little bit about student life. There's all kinds of societies you can join, um, 120 different student societies from cooking to Harry Potter to all kinds of things. Um, it's, it's a pretty relaxed campus, so quiet, but, but then that we have a nice students union for, for events and, and socializing. We also have a student volunteer center. Um, I know a lot of our students on these programs are very focused upon volunteer opportunities, especially if you're interested in going into medicine and we have a whole center that links you with those opportunities in the community. Um, and then there's also student ambassador opportunities, and that's where our student ambassadors are exactly that. They're really ambassadors that, that work with the university to reach out to uh, potential students and families all over the world um, and, and sort of advocate for us as a university. So a little bit about the accommodation. Um, we have 
accommodation both on the Singleton campus and newer accommodation on the Bay campus. We also have a student village, which is off campus. Um, it runs anywhere from about 91 pounds to 195 pounds per week. Um, and uh, there's designated, there's also off campus housing that we work with the community around. There's everything from, from studios to on suites to, to premium suites. And, and we, of course, have all sorts of uh, accessible accommodation for those with, with differing abilities. So lots of different accommodation all over, both at the K Bay campus, off campus, as well as Singleton campus. So a little bit uh, about the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Science. We, we're composed of three different schools. So the faculty system is something new at Swansea University. We used to be about seven or eight, depending on how you counted things, different schools. But what we've done is we've kept those schools, but we've coalesced them into faculties. So our faculty is really around medicine, health, and, and people. So we are uh, include the School of Medicine, the, the school that I'm primarily located in, School of Medicine, the School of Health and Social Care, as well as the School of Psychology. And this has really given us an advantage for both our students and our staff in that we're much better connected up now. So, so where we might have been different before and had some parallel activities, but, but not really interacting in terms of teaching or research, we've got bigger bridges between those colleges. And I, as the Associate Dean International for that faculty, have oversight over all of those programs and all the international activity in those three schools. Um, lots of our courses are accredited by what we call professional bodies. So they are the regulatory bodies in the UK that sort of govern those professions. So for instance, for medicine, there's the General Medical Council. For pharmacies, there's the General Pharmaceutical Council. There's also the Nursing and Midwifery Council. So not on, only do we work with academics, we work very closely uh, with with academics in our own schools, but we work very closely with those regulatory bodies. We also work very closely with the local health boards. So the people who are actually delivering that care, we're very connected into as well. So, so not only do we engage in these activities as an academic exercise, we also um, engage with the wider community in actually delivering those services. So uh, lots of rankings are involved with with higher education and there's new rankings every year and things go up and down um, so uh, i think i'd like to say the most important thing whether you choose swansea or not is that you choose a place that you feel comfortable studying and you can see yourself spending at least the next three years perhaps more staying there and and uh engaging with the community and engaging with your studies that said um Rankings are important, you know, they, they do factor into perhaps how potential employers view your application later. Um, so, so, of course, it's important to think about rankings, but uh, it's more about where you feel comfortable. That said, I'm very happy to say that Swansea is extremely highly ranked as well. So, so we're friendly, but we're highly ranked. We're number one for medicine, according to the Complete University Guide. Um, we are number four in the UK for the research exercise framework. So we, and that's out of, of I think about 40 different medical schools. So, so we're a smaller place, we're a friendly place, but uh, we're also having quite an impact through um, our our innovative research and teaching and learning that occurs around that. So this slide just kind of gives you a flavor for some of our university. We're, we're, we have a local feel, but we definitely punch above our weight in terms of um, our, our rankings and research quality and, and teaching environment. Um, like I said, we're partnered with different local health boards. There's a hospital right next to our Singleton campus. Um, we are also linked to Morriston Hospital up uh, it's a few miles up the valley from us. Um, we have lots of facilities on campus. We even have um, what we call the Institute for Life Science, which is a uh, 
companies located right within our university buildings, many of which are spun out from some of our academic research. So our researchers have come up with an innovative idea that they've br then brought to market, and those offices are housed right with us in the medical school medical school and and often our students will become engaged with those commercial activities through research projects or summer placements so we're very well connected up that way so what kind of research do we focus on well we have lots of different areas of research but we have sort of four core areas that a lot of things uh, sort of a lot of our activities emanate from so we have biomarkers and genes um, so we look at genetic aspects of disease and therapeutics. Uh, we also have medical devices. We have microbes and immunity, as well as patient population health and informatics. That last one's primarily around data. So looking at medical data for people. So, so lots of research can happen in the laboratory, you know, looking at different organisms or cells or, or pathways, but lots of, uh, um, the way research now moves in medicine is analyzing data and health records and things like that. So we're one of the UK's foremost centers for, for that health data. And we, are, we, are, we house all the medical information in Wales. Um, so that allows us to uh, really dig deeply into that, um, that information. In fact, we played a key role um, in the, government's response to COVID because we did have that information available and members of our academic staff were part of the government's scientific advisory group because we hold that data here. So lots of important research happening. Um, like I said, we, we not only engage with governments and health boards and things like that, but we uh, work very closely with a number of com companies. This is a mapping exercise that I recently did. And by my count, uh, we work with about 79 different international companies. So here's some of those logos and, and also governmental organizations. So, so what how can you as a student link up with these activities? Um, and we very much try and integrate our students into these activities and not just have you study in the building where these things happen to be being researched. We integrate you into those activities and I can tell you how um, in our course structures. So, um, but what are the degrees that you're, you're available to, are available to you to study? So Applied Medical Sciences, this was a course that um, I personally developed about seven years ago um, and if you think about it, it's a lot like biomedical sciences. So, so learning about how the body works, how the how how different um, bodily functions are altered in health and disease, um, but also really thinking about how that information is applied. So we can learn lots about different biological pathways, but not only do you learn about the pathway and all the molecules involved, but you learn about how that's applied to scientific problems, to pr problems of health. So really a bench to bedside type approach to that. We also have um, very well established biochemistry programs, genetics programs, those they're pretty much, as they say, you know, outstanding uh, programs that have been well established in both of those areas. Medical pharmacology is one of our newer programs and pharmacology is different than pharmacy. So this is kind of a, I'm a pharmacologist, so this is a little bit of a, of a thing for me. So um, pharmacology is the science of how drugs work drugs and therapeutics work because sometimes the lines between what is a drug and what isn't a drug um, can be blurred. So the science of how drugs work and so how they can be used pharma uh, therapeutically, but also be used as research tools. So uh, pharmacy is the dispensing of those drugs. Pharmacology is the science of those drugs. Okay, so that's a program that I think is in about its fifth year now. Um, and then we have population health and medical sciences, which is a course that learns many of the scientific elements of the other courses, but also has uh, a, a, a data focus. So I was speaking about that big database we have of all that medical information. So that course will take you from molecules to man, to data, to population. So the 
population health and medical sciences. So extending on that knowledge a little bit from individuals to populations. We also have with outside of those, but related to those programs, we have foundation year programs that precede those, um, but we also have masters in science um, courses that extend those and I'll explain those in just a second as well. So how can students tailor their studies? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, you'll have some optional modules within the courses that you're able to pick, but we also have what we call our employability strand. So we have the medical science research strand, we have the enterprise and innovation strand, and we have the medical science and practice strand. So the medical science research strand is for people who are very much interested in doing scientific research, maybe going into academia, but also industry with that. So learning to be sort of a bench scientist or a data type scientist. Um, then we have the enterprise and innovation strand, which you're still learning to be a scientist um, and a properly trained scientist, but maybe you're thinking a little bit more about the commercial aspects of those programs. So thinking about um, not just bench to bedside, but bench to bedside to market perhaps. So just an added flavor around that. And then we have the medical science and practice strand, and that's to train you as a scientist still. A scientist first and foremost is the ethos in our in our courses, but perhaps to go on into a medically related field, such as uh, obviously the practice of medicine. So our students will go on to graduate entry medical school, sometimes nursing, midwifery, even dentistry um, or physician associates, those students will go on to. So that clinically focused element. I, I take this point to very much emphasize that our courses are not what we call pre-med. So if you've if you've seen some other courses, maybe around the UK, um, that are kind of like a precedent to medical school, and you know that that that's great, but but what we find is um, a lot of students, a will. Uh, perhaps not have an idea of the of the breadth of of careers that are associated with medicine but aren't necessarily clinically oriented so i thought i wanted to be a doctor when i started out in science but i didn't realize that i could still do the science of medicine without uh patient interaction so um and then so so some students will be absolutely convinced that they want to go into medicine, but then they'll realize that there's lots of opportunities outside of that. Also, some students just won't get into medicine. And so it's also important to train you as a scientist first and foremost, so that you're able to do something with your undergraduate degree without getting into medicine. So um, that pathway has an extra little criterion around it in that you have to achieve at least a 60% average in your first year to go onto that pathway. And that's not to say that the other pathways aren't as challenging or, or aren't as important or prestigious. It's just that we need to make sure that you're on the right track to get at least a 2-1 type a degree so that you can be admitted a 2-1 is required for entry into graduate entry medicine. So we want to make sure that you're on the right track and that we're sending our very best students on that pathway. So, uh, so a little bit about um, that pathway, a little bit more um, around that pathway to medicine. So um, what that means is you've gotten that 60% in your first year, which means that that's a 60% overall average. It's not 60% in every module. Um, what that means is in your second year, you'll take a module called Doctors, Patients, and the Goals of Medicine. And that's exactly that. So you learn about the doctor's patient relationship and the goals of medicine, which can be quite varied according to the situation clinically. So, um, and within that, you'll have uh, a clinical observation where you get to um, observe the patient, uh, doctor-patient relationships, and you have to do some reflective work around that and really dig deep into what it means to be, to be a doctor and how the National Health Service works um, and things like that. So, Within that pathway, you have to then, so you take that module, you have to then get a 60% uh, mark in that particular module. 
okay? Um, and in reality, you need to be still achieving that 60% average overall. Um, you meet some other minimum entry criteria that you can find on our website. You have to get a minimum GAMSAT score, et cetera. And then what you get is a guaranteed interview with us for uh, graduate entry medicine here at Swansea. So that means that if you do, um, and, and that, that interview is really the step to medicine. So if you do very well at that uh, interview, you, you can get offered a place on medicine, but it's a guaranteed interview. It's not a guaranteed spot. And we don't have a maximum minimum uh, number of spots available to our students. So if the whole course got into medicine, that's great. Um, you know, so there's not that sort of competition with each other, but there's also not a fixed number of ring fence spots. So, so please have a look if you're interested in the pathway, have a look at our website and that can tell you a little bit more detail around that, but that's sort of it in a nutshell. So getting the magic number in all of that is 60%. So 60% in year one, 60% in that module, and then um, you need to have GAMSAT uh, um, exam or, or MCAT, or then, then, then you'll get a um, guaranteed interview and then, and then hopefully you get an offer for medicine. So um, a little bit about our medicine program. We are graduate entry only. So I think we're one of two graduate entry only courses in the UK. Um, so some other places might have a little bit of graduate entry, but are primarily undergraduate. So all of our students have an undergraduate degree. And we know that the advantage that that gives them is that they feel, and because of the course's design, is that they feel better prepared when they when they graduate from us and then go out on the wards than 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 people that have done an undergraduate degree. It's a four-year course instead of a five-year course, but it's, it's very much condensed into uh, the academic year. So you have lots and lots of time um, and it's smaller summer <laughs> than a lot of our students, but, but it does get you through in four years. Um, and we really feel that that's the, I, I couldn't believe when I came in the, in America, the only, all of medicine is graduate entry. And when I came to the UK the first time and people told me that that people were going to medical school as undergraduates, I couldn't believe it because I just really, really very much believe in, in graduate entry medicine. I think that it's a more informed choice. Uh, we have more mature, mature students who are um, are really prepared to be the best doctors and are prepared um, for the challenges that, that come along with that life, life choice. It really is a life choice around deciding to practice medicine. And um, in 2022, we were first in the UK um, from the complete university guide for, for medicine. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, okay, so. Okay, so what if you want to do research? And I don't, I, I don't want to emphasize that that our courses are just for people who want to do medicine. Lots of people um, come to the courses and think, "Oh, I definitely want to do that." But as I said, um, it probably winds up about two thirds of the people who join the course think they want to do medicine, and in the end, it's about a quarter who actually do. They they decide um, to not apply. They don't get in. They they just decide that research is for them. So that's about how it whittles out. Um, so uh, you can do BSc, a BSc degree, and then you're prepared to do um, lots of different professions, which I'll tell you about. Um, you'll do a laboratory research project. Or if you decided you'd like to do a little bit more research, you could do what we call an MSI, um, and that's available on a number of the courses um, where you do um, an undergraduate degree, basically three years, and then you do an advanced project in your fourth year. So you graduate, graduate with a master's of science. Okay, so an extended thing that's very, very attractive if to, to different companies in and of itself, uh, organizations, but also if you are thinking about doing a, a PhD, that MSI route is a really nice um, pathway to that. Okay. 
And so what, lots of different students and parents ask me all the time, so what can I do with these undergraduate degrees? What does it mean um, in terms of getting a job when you're done? It costs a lot of money to do an undergraduate degree. So you obviously want to get a return on that investment. So like I said, you can continue in academia with further, further study, either in medicine or um, MSci or a PhD. Um, and postgraduate, um, you could be a clinical scientist, you can go into research and development, health informatics, lots of different health uh, professions with further study, working for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I've had lots of students who um, have had a scientific undergraduate degree, but then have gone on to do postgraduate law. Um, and that's been very lucrative for a number of students because what they're finding is that those legal firms are very interested in in um, their lawyers having that scientific training first prior to law so that they understand the science and then and then gain that legal background. Um, so you can go into teaching, forensics, the food and beverage industry, regulatory industries. Um, what we know is that companies, um, um, and I heard this recently from the former CEO of Pepsi, um, the big international beverage and food conglomerate. She's, she's uh, Indira Modi, I believe is her name. And she said that she really likes um, employing people who know how to think like scientists, who can just think like scientists. And that's our real goal with our programs is to teach you to think like a scientist, even if you perhaps don't even go into science um, as a career. So um, our typical requirements um, for a lot of our courses, these are available on the websites. I'm not going to go through them individually. It is quite competitive to get into our courses. So we, we tend to take the, the top students. Um, and then if you're an overseas student, you can see the equivalencies. Those are list, listed there. So um, various different um, A-level requirements, but usually the range is AA, well, AAA or um, to BBB, um, and chopped and changed with biochemistry, uh, or sorry, with biology, chemistry elements within that. So have a look there. We have our English language requirement of ELTS of 6.0 with no less than 5.5 in all compo components. So um, competitive courses to get onto, um, but nevertheless, if you don't make those requirements, we do have what we call a foundation year, which gives you an extra year at the beginning to really prepare you um, for our courses. And the way that we view them is, it's not a rehash of what you've already done um, in your previous education. So for instance, if you did A level or you did international back, it's not a rehash of those elements. It's really a preparation, a special, especially a very laboratory focused hands-on preparation for the further three years of your course with us. And we've done some analysis around that. And we know that our students who come on to the foundation year for all of our courses do as well or better in all of their modules. So it's an outstanding preparation, gives you an extra year to get used to university. Um, and we have had many of our students last year get into medicine with that or go on to PhD. So that's an outstanding pathway. If you felt like I don't have the marks, I'll never be able to be a clinician or get a PhD. This is really a lovely um, step up. I was a, not a very good student and I'm a professor <laughs> early on in my career. It really took me getting onto um, a subject that I was very passionate about. So I wanna give um, students that same opportunity to have a little step up to, to get them into a, an excellent program that can lead them to their, um, fulfill their, their aspirations. So still same pathway to medicine, everything applies from that. Now, the key with that foundation year is, remember I said for the pathway to medicine, the 60% is key. 60%, again, is key for the foundation year. To progress from foundation year to the rest of the three years of the course, you have to achieve at least a 60% average. If you don't, it's just an average across that. Um, you can do some resets um, in, in particular areas, depending on the modules, um, but there's also an exit qualification. You could go and do another course, but we do say that you have to get 60% um, in that first year to progress onto the other three years. 
Um, and that's roughly um, around the, the, the requirements for what we're looking at for a typical offer for that foundation year. Um, we have scholarships available for, for excellent students um, according to your, your um, qualifications. So please do have a look at that. Um, if you've done outstandingly well, we like to um, encourage those students to come study with us with some financial bursaries um, and then just have a look at those, those deadlines around that. And if you have any questions, I'm sure that Bethany um, and, and her colleagues can, can help with that. So, um, and then we also have an English language service um, in terms of, of maybe doing some upskilling in, in that um, language activity. Um, science is a universal language. So, so really um, working within science is, can be a real, a really good tool in learning to communicate a, a around the world, um, not just in science as well. So that's really good. Um, and like I said, we, we, we are an outstanding university that does very impactful world renowned research, but we very much care about our students. We want to get to know you. Um, every student will have an academic mentor. So that is someone that you would meet with an, an academic. Um, you meet with them at least once a term um, and more if you need to one on one to have discussions around how you're doing academically. Um, that person can also signpost you to support within the university for a variety of things, mental health support, financial support. They're really that sort of key um, to help you um, with your studies and help ensure your success with us. We also have disability support, equality and diversity champions. We have an outstanding international office that's specifically geared towards supporting our international students. Um, we have counseling, we have an employability academy, um, which will help you think about careers after your graduation. Um, we also have a center for academic success that will help you with those English language elements, as well as essay writing, math skills, all sorts of things. So not just going to class um, and, and going to lectures and doing practicals. There's a whole other facet of the university that sits outside of those things to help support your success um, academically and personally. So um, like I said, the Center for Academic Success has, has lots of things to help you with around English language, but also again, essay writing, uh, academic writing, grammar, maths. I could probably use that every once in a while. <laughs> um, some pa academic pitfalls, also writing um, CVs. So curriculum vita so for job applications and things like that. So um, this slide tells you how to apply. It's easy to do. You just go on our website um, and then apply online and Medical Doorway um, will also help you with that. Um, so, so it's a pretty, pretty straightforward process. So, um, and now I would be very happy to take any questions. If you don't think of any right now, um, you can always um, email this this address or I'm sure medical doorway as well and we can get back in touch with some answers so I think with that I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to take any questions right thanks professor Wallace for that yeah uh as I said for those students who are online now or for those perhaps watching on social media or watching this afterwards IB results come out next week so it's going to be very critical if you are an IB candidate and you find out your results, I think it's Monday or Tuesday, that you do get in contact with Medical Doorway, you know, as soon as possible so we can get you through that apply system. One of the big things, actually, which we haven't talked about is uh, visas for the UK at the moment. Obviously, the situation is visas are a bit delayed at the moment with what's going on in Ukraine because the hope the visa section are dealing with Ukrainian refugee visas as well. So the sooner we get your application in, the better to make sure that we can get you to the university on time this coming September. So there are a couple of questions. And then what I'm going to ask people to do is if you've got questions now, just type them into the Q&A feature. And it doesn't matter what your question is. It doesn't matter even if it was discussed in the presentation, because not everyone can take everything in in one lecture. Believe me, uh, I'm a former university lecturer myself, I do find myself repeating uh, myself because sometimes people can't take everything in, which is normal, which is just normal. So someone says, 
Uh, does it make four years before we go to med school? Based on the presentation, the medical program is a four year graduate entry program. And there are two pathways in terms of timelines into that. You've got the three year BSc from the different options that were presented, which will make it a seven year pathway. But if you needed the foundation year, yes, it would be a foundation year into the three year program, BSc into the four year pathway, if that's what you wanted to do. One thing I think we discussed when I was at the university in, in I think it was February now, I, I believe, is that students come in thinking they want to go to medicine, but quite often identify when they're doing their BSc that perhaps their interest lies somewhere else. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that, uh, Professor Wallace, and how, that's, how the course is designed to allow students to actually perhaps change their mind during, the, uh, during their studies? Yes, definitely. So, so within it, within the course, you, you get exposed, you'll have different um, discussions from people who are clinicians, but also scientists to present their work and have discussions around um, what they're doing. So that kind of gives you, and you know, for instance, medical writing, I, I, that's not something that many students have heard of when they're um, engaging in their, in their studies prior to university. So that gives you, um, so, so if you're maybe a good writer, but you like science as well, that's an opportunity that you may not have realized. And also really through that um, doctors, patients, schools of medicine module, I think people think that, you know, a lot of time being a doctor is, is seeing patients, diagnosing them and, and helping them with that, which it, it is a portion of, but there's also a lot of dealing with the health service, dealing with uh, a lot of the other elements, bureaucracy, governmental organizations. And a lot of times it's not quite as glamorous as people think or and can present different challenges. So um, we, we tell students that if they take that pathway and they decide that medicine isn't for them, that's a success as well because they haven't wasted their time um, and they can see that, okay, these courses will also give them the opportunity to do something else in terms of science. And, and so for instance, I started out thinking I wanted to, to be a doctor. Um, I didn't really get the grades. So I decided, uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and do a PhD and then think about it. And so everybody said, well, well, of course, Lisa, you're going to go into medicine, right? Because my supervisor was a neurologist. And then I thought to myself, you know, no, I want to do, I want to know the science. I want to know medicine, but I don't really want to, to see patients on a daily basis. So I have a profession that's very much integrated with science and medicine, but it doesn't involve the day-to-day -day seeing patients on a schedule. So, so really that gives you the aspects. And I really, really think that if students do decide that medicine is for them, they have made that commitment. They've, get, they've done a really informed decision about what that actually means. And we do know that our students that do graduate entry medicine with us have far less burnout than other people that have done an undergraduate degree. And they feel more prepared when they get on the wards. So I, I hope that answered your question. I'll mute myself. Uh, someone's just asked if they're a local UK student, uh, can they pay international fees if they've not got a place? Unfortunately, you can't do that, I'm afraid. Uh, if you're a domestic home fee student, you have to go through UCAS the same as everyone else to make sure everything's equitable because what we can't, it can't be seen that people can pay more just to get access. That's just not, not how UK higher education system works, I'm afraid. So you'd have to go through UCAS or if you wanted to go through the foundation pathway, if based on, on your eventual A-levels, uh, that was there were still seats available for you then in clearing, then that is obviously something which you'd have to look at with the university. That's not something I can help with because we're only allowed to work with international students with, with Swansea. Uh, but I, if, I, don't, I don't mind if you know UK students want to use this presentation because it's a fantastic presentation open to all. Someone's asked, uh, is the foundation programme, and this is not a question I've got an answer to, so I'm going to delegate this one to uh, Professor Wallace and to Bethany, but is the foundation programme open to mature students from a non-science background? Because in, there are different foundation programmes in different program, uh, universities that are perhaps not focused much on the grades or lower grades on the sciences, but are more focused on perhaps people have not studied STEM subjects at, say, you know, uh, level three. 
So I would encourage, so yes, we, we absolutely love mature students. We love them coming on the courses. Some of our, our top students have been mature students who have raised families and then decided to go to university. Um, now I would, I would emphasize you, I would ask you to get in touch with, um, someone from admissions around the background with that, because we do want you to have some scientific background in STEM, um, because it's not really that foundation year isn't a replacement for, for science, um, those elements. It's sort of an enhancement around that. So the answer is yes and no. So, so really get in touch around admissions, and I'm sure Medical Doorway can help you with that as well. So in thinking about um, maybe you wouldn't have all of it, maybe you wouldn't have biology and chemistry, um, and there's then there's different elements within, for instance, the international back that we take that are maybe not as strong as someone who, who has those core elements um so but in that foundation year can enhance so the so i would encourage it's sort of a case by case thing but we we absolutely love um mature students and then someone has asked if i did not choose swansea in ucas can i apply well if you're applying for the undergraduate program you're not applying straight to medicine you're applying to one of the pathway programs as if i did not apply to swansea in ucas can i apply for the programs in clearing if i get very good grades that's going to be dependent on how many seats are still available. And the way it works is the universities know a few days before how many places they'll have available, but they're only going to go into clearing on A-level results day. So I think if you're in the UCAS system, if you applied through UCAS and you're released into clearing, then obviously you can then identify see if there are seats available through the clearing system at Swansea. If not, you can obviously contact the university yourself as well. Uh, their admissions officer will always be open uh, on clearing. Very busy if you look, if you, you might struggle to get through initially, but be patient. And then the university admissions office will be able to give you advice uh, and guidance on that then. It's something I used to deal with every year when I was working in, in universities in my admissions capacity within, uh, within a faculty. So we do have another question which has come up. Please explain for an IB student completing the IB diploma program in May 2023, this is an international student for next year with good scores of six and seven, how strict would the admission process be? And how would you insist on the IELTS score? I think if you're taking the IB, the English on the IB based on a certain uh, curriculum is acceptable in lieu of IELTS, I believe I'm correct in stating. I believe so or, too. I would get in touch with our admissions, but I, I believe so as well. Yeah, we, we love uh, IB students. We, we find that they're, they're really, they tend to do very well on our course. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's what would happen is you would get, if we applied early for these programs, if you're coming from the IB, my advice is we do apply early on the Medical Doorway website. If you then receive an offer, that will be conditional, and that will obviously stipulate a particular condition on your IB. Overall points and then points in the STEM subjects at the higher level as well, depending on which program we've applied to. On the whole, if you've got both biology and chemistry on the higher level, you can apply to any of the pathway options at the institution. Uh, then if you meet the terms of that offer on 4th or 5th of July 2023, then obviously your offer is 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 is, is becomes unconditional automatically. Uh, then it is just a question if you do miss by one or two points or you miss by a small amount, the university will then be able to look at that, look at your personal statement, look at your references, not, not just look at the grade, look at the number, because as a student, you're not just an IB score. You come with an entire different set of qualitative data which often can determine how successful you can be. And it's that then the university will then make an, an academic decision. Sometimes they will, may have to wait until A-level results have been issued. So you may have to wait a month and a bit just to check so they can look at everyone equally. But like I said, if you've met the terms of your offer, your offer becomes unconditional and you'll then straight through to start uh, studying at Swansea in, in this case for you, September, 2023. So it is, if you don't meet the terms, it is going to be dependent on how many seats are available and how far away you are, obviously. But I uh, uh, can't give you a direct answer to that. But again, IELTS, just take a look at your uh, English language curriculum on the IB. Usually that's accepted, just as GCSE uh, assignments would be. And, and if I can, yeah, go ahead. If Lee. I could just add, sorry. So what we will try and do mm -hmm. is if, 
if we have room on the foundation year, we will try and, you know, say, say we can't offer you a spot on the three-year course, we will try and put you into the foundation year. Um, we can't guarantee that because a lot of students will have directly applied for that foundation year as well. So, um, but we do try and, and, and make that work if at all possible through that mechanism, especially if you express to us, you know, if, if you're feeling like it's going to be on a border um, or something, we can work with medical doorway, we can speak to you directly. And, and if you make known to us that, I, listen, I really want to be on the course, but I might be on the border, let us know and we can, we can work within that. So. We're, we're reasonable people. It's not an, an automatic yes, no. Yeah. I mean, it is very much as, as you said, based upon what the pool looks like, you know, and then that pool changes from each year. Um, this year is quite competitive. Um, mm. um, last year it was all over the place. So, so it's, it can move and we want to make sure that we put students in a cohort that fix, fits them. So, um, if we do have to make a decision around putting you into the foundation year, please understand that we really do feel like that's to benefit you and, and your teaching and learning. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll try and make it work between the two. Thanks. Great. Okay. We've got 10 minutes. We've scheduled about an hour. For, well, we scheduled over an hour, but usually it's about an hour. We just let it overrun, but we haven't got any more questions at the moment. I'm just going to check our social media and we've had a few thumbs up and a few comments, but no actual questions. So that's good. So what I would say is if anyone's got any more questions now, just do type them in because we want to make, make sure we do answer them in the, in the in the last few minutes we've got. I think one, <clears throat> one thing that I came across was the links to industry that came across in the presentations there. Can you give me some examples of what some students have done on the three-year programs? Because I think that's something I think which is absolutely very, I thought anyway, from my experience, and I've worked with many universities, is quite unique actually at Swansea. Yeah, so a lot of times um, our our academic researchers will will, for instance, be one of the part of one of those companies um, in the Institute of Life Science, and so our students most frequently what they'll do is they'll do their final year project. So all of our students, um, unless they do an M side, they'll they'll do it in that that fourth year, all of our students in their third year do um, a dissertation project where they work one-on-one -on -one with a researcher um, or one of those companies. So um, that that's a frequent mechanism through which, so, so there's really kind of the lines between um, academic research and industry re research are very blurred <laughs> at Swansea, which is, which is really a good thing because you get a really authentic experience through that. You can also have what we call a spin placement. That's a summer placement with one of those companies where you go and work with them. We've had some students work on medical devices. We've had students go and work on developing apps that record medical data. Um, my own laboratory is uh, putting together, so I work on worms. I know not everyone rush to volunteer, <laughs> but we, we have a, a model of, of a pharmacological model where we give worms drugs. And so it's quite interesting to see because they it alters their behavior and you can tell what a, an unknown substance is because we've created this whole big profile on how the worms behave on different substances. So if we have an unknown substance, we can give it to the worms and say, well, that looks like cocaine. That looks like, like alcohol or amphetamine or something like that. So what we've done with that is we've marketed that to um, other institutions who want to teach that in vivo pharmacology. So as a teaching tool, we're also working um, to, to develop a model for prisons for, for them to be able to say, okay, lots of substances are smuggled into prisons. We don't know what the substance is, so we can give it to these worms and see what it potentially is. Is it a substance like a stimulant or a suppressant or something like that? So developing um, resources, large and small. And then some of our uh, our institution, our researchers work with big pharmaceutical companies like AstraZeneca or, or even one of our researchers, Dr. Kate Chapman, she worked with the cosmetic company Lush around different uh, substances within their cosmetics. So um, lots and lots of different things integrated there. And I think that really does, that's a really good point that it does set us apart from a lot of um, other institutions that we have that. So those... Okay. I think we'll deal with the last question now, which is a quite sure. a basic one, which is good, but you know, it's an important one. Someone's asked about the fee structure. 
So <clears throat> do check the website because the fees do change slightly every year just because of inflation, okay? But it's not a five-year pathway. So you've got the three-year bachelor's degree and the fees are around about, I think, 19 and a half thousand pounds now. I think that's correct, isn't it, Bethany? It's around that level, give or take a few pounds. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, 19,600. <laughs> there we go. I wasn't far away. I like to round it down usually. Uh, not that there's any negotiations on that. And then the the... Four-year medical program is around about thirty-eight thousand pounds, I think, or thirty-nine thousand pounds at the moment, as it stands at the moment. But obviously, when you progress to the four-year program in three years' time or four years' time, if you were either on the foundation or admitting in twenty twenty-three, it is going to be slightly higher then. So, my advice is do keep an eye on the Medical Doorway website, the Swansea website, and obviously, you've got those scholarships as well, which we mentioned before. And last year, some of our students did actually get some scholarships to actually, uh, you know, lower the cost of studying on the BSc uh, and I've probably got a number of students who would be applying for those scholarships already this year as well. I mean that's kind of brought an end to those questions if anything else pops up in the next few uh, few minutes. Uh, what I would say is if you are looking at applying to Swansea do put the application through on the Medical Doorway website sooner than sooner rather than later. The sooner we get your application on the university database, the sooner the university admissions team, both in the faculty and central university can start looking at it. And the sooner we get you an offer, at least you can then do some more research, start planning that future. Because the sooner we do things, usually the better the result is, because we're not rushing around looking for paperwork and worrying about visas, etc. Medical Doorway is a British Council certified organisation, uh, which is a requirement uh, for most universities to work uh, with organizations like ourselves. Our service is fully free of charge. Uh, you know, we have come across other agencies trying to kind of claim lots of money from students. This is why Swansea work with us when we do these webinars to make sure you get the correct information and you know it's coming straight from the university and that you can trust the Medical Doorway team here. Uh, and we are going to be visiting schools across the world next year now that travel's opened up. So we are expecting to be in the Emirates at some point and then fingers crossed in December in Hong Kong if all, all goes well, uh, depending on reopening. So hopefully we'll be in some of your schools to be able to meet you, your school counsellors, even your parents potentially as well and discuss this and many other opportunities for your future. OK, as there are no more questions, I want to say a huge thank you to Professor Wallace. I will see you again next month, I believe, in, in, in Swansea and to Bethany as well and Cecilia, who's not here today, but she coordinated all this to make it possible. So I do want to say go on the record and say thank you to Cecilia as well. And I, uh, if you've got any more questions, any students watching the recording or who've been live today, just do drop us an email to Medical Doorway, hello at medicaldoorway.com, or do go on to our website and fill an inquiry form. And we'll be able to get back to you uh, with any of the answers that you need. OK, thank you so much and have a great day and a great week ahead. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.